so when I was up, or Catherine asked me to take part in this, um, I was thinking about rethinking dementia. What are the important things that I harp on about a lot to anyone that will listen? And I know there's a few people on this call who, please, I'll apologise if you might have heard this before. Um, but for me, one of the key things I think we have to think about differently, maybe, is we're starting to do really well on person-centred care and really understanding what that means looking at the person. So if you're looking at the person with dementia, not just ticking a box, but actually really thinking about who they are, what they want, what their dreams are, how they would like us to treat them, how they want to treat us. Um, we need to do the same for the carers because I'm a former carer and a diagnosis of dementia doesn't just happen to the person. It happens to their family, it happens to their friends, it happens to the people around them. But what we forget to think about is the relationship between particularly the, the key carer and the person who's living with dementia. So for me, my main one was my mother. I looked after my mum who had vascular dementia and I realised she was getting lost a bit. Um, and so was I in a way, because after her diagnosis, she became the person with dementia and I became the carer. And as mum used to say, but I'm the mum because I became really protective of her. Um, almost wanted to wrap her in cotton wool and put her on a shelf and keep her safe because suddenly I'm, I'm responsible for her. And it was quite a scary thing. And I really overdid it. And I think a lot of us do. Um, and I had to learn, and she taught me, that actually that was one of her key roles in life was to teach me. And she also looked after me. And she'd always looked after me. She was my mum. So I realised that, and, and it was quite interesting to hear both um, Serena talking about how many people wanted to feel useful and Gerald also talking a lot about how important it was for him to still feel useful. So for mum, I had to think about, okay, those two key roles for her, because I was an only child and she was a, a stay-at-home mum and um, a really good one, I hasten to add. Um, I might be a bit biased there, but she was incredible. And uh, so important thing for her was to teach me. And we both have a passion for gardens. So she taught me a lot about gardening and I found that that was something we could keep doing. And on a good day, she'd say to me, well, you know how to take cuttings. And it was quite obvious for her that I would actually, oh, and here she is. So that's my mum gardening. So it was quite um, obvious for her on a good day if I, you know, you should know this. But I'd say, well, I, I've been having some failures recently. So actually, I thought maybe you could teach me and I'd hope that your memory would mean that you wouldn't remember. Um, and on a bad day, she'd have no idea. I mean, she might even not even realise who I was, but she would sit up in her chair, she'd sit up and she'd smile and she'd teach me how to take cuttings. And it made her day because she was useful. She was doing something that was really meaningful to her. Um, on that picture, she was probably for about the fourth or fifth time putting those plants back into those pots because in the evening I'd take them back out, put them into little pots and um, we kept doing that until those poor plants started looking a bit sad and we had to get some more. Um, and she didn't always remember, but that the most important thing for her was she was working with me, deciding which pots we we're going to do, um, showing how to plant them and it was the about the time that she spending and the interaction between the two of us rather than actually those pots and the other thing she could do she, as being my mum was it's quite an emotional thing when you're going through looking after someone it's frustrating it's it's sad and I used to have a lot of emotions and at first I used to think I'm the carer my job's to be the strong one my job's to be the one that looks after my mum and I can't cry and I can't get upset in front of her that I'd, we don't do that with carers but actually her big role for me was when I was bullied at school or when I was going through things at work or my marriage breakup and various other things I went through in my life. She always was the one that actually arms around me, made me a cup of tea. And then after we'd had the hug and the cup of tea, I'd sit down in front of her with my knee on her lap and she just stroked my hair. And that was something she could do despite her dementia. And actually sometimes it was when maybe she was quite frustrated and well, when, you, when you've, you're when you in that situation, who do you take out on? The person that you know is gonna be there, the, no, the person you know that you trust to have your back. So when she was feeling frustrated, 
she would take out me. Why wouldn't she? But I'm human being as well. So we actually got into this wonderful thing where when it did happen, she would sit down and she would actually just have my, my head in her knee and she'd stroke my hair and she'd make me feel better. So I got what I needed from her and she got what she needed, which was she got to be useful again, which is so important to her. Um, and the other thing she, she taught me was actually I still need to live. And we were doing a piece of work with Hampshire County Council about what older people need out of life. And she came up with a strap line to this, this work. And there was about 10 or 11 people, older people, um, two of which had dementia. And it was the final meeting where the council was saying, we need to think about you know, the strap lines that go on the report. And mom came up with this wonderful phrase, there's no point in keeping us alive if we don't have a life. And I took that to heart and thought, okay, we're gonna go out and we're gonna do stuff. So my other big thing I harp on about is, is the risk. And I learned that, yeah, you've got to be worried about the physical risk. What if, what if she goes out and gets lost? And she did a few times because she loved to explore. Um, what if she falls over? What if? But when you're doing that, you forget about the kind of social risk. And I think we've all had a classic example of that with lockdown of how much we need people around us. I mean, we just look at what's going on with mental health and, and isolation at the moment. And when you get a diagnosis of dementia, I think quite often it's, it's easy for you to become incredibly isolated, both of you, the carer and the person, because people get a bit frightened about getting into your life. What am I gonna say? Am I gonna say the wrong thing? Am I gonna, you know, how are they gonna behave? I don't know how to do this. I don't know how to be with this person now. And they forget that this is just a human being you've known for a long time who has some memory problems. And so things might change and, and there's a lot of information out there you can find, but people, I think, get a bit scared and they back off. So you can get very emotionally isolated, sorry, um, socially isolated. So there's a big social risk there of what might happen if you don't get out and do things. And then there's the emotional risk. And um, I volunteer with Dementia Adventure. And please do Google it. They're great. Um, they take people on holiday and they do all sorts of things, getting people out and, out and about. And they do a lot of work about this thing about balancing risk and looking at taking care of the physical aspects of someone and, and trying to stop them getting hurt. You forget about the emotional part and what people need. And most of us, I mean, as Gerald said, we don't like the thought of sitting in a you know, plastic chair. And why would someone want to do that for the rest of their, rest of their life? You know, our proudest moments have been, and if you think back, if you're going to tell someone what's your pro proudest thing you've ever done in your life it's not sitting in a chair looking out of a window it's about whatever you've done you know mine's water white water rafting brilliant used to do it when I was younger um so let's get people out doing things a bit more and if we can perhaps share the second photograph um I had an auntie this is Anna Marie coming up so this is Anna Marie she's my aunt um German lady who emigrated to Canada in the early 60s met mum's younger brother who'd gone over there in the in the early 50s married him and I first went over in my when I was 20 and Anne-Marie she, she taught me how to kayak and it had been something that we always did when we went over there um her husband Ray was was terrified of water as was my mum both frightened of, of, of drowning because neither of them ever learned how to swim so Anne-Marie and I'd go out and we'd kayak together and we lost my uncle Ray six weeks before we lost mum back in 2013. And I went over to his memorial and it was held at a friend's place who had this lake. And about an hour into the, um, the event, which was, was a barbecue with lots of people talking about Ray and his life. And he was a great ecologist. He was, he was brilliant. Um, we started getting the kayaks out and I was, a bit, I was really nervous when Anne-Marie got in. And they all said, no, it's fine. She's fine. She does it all the time. Every time she comes here, she does this. And it took her within a minute, she got back into how do I hold the oar? And off she went. And our biggest problem wasn't any risk to her. Our biggest problem was how do we get her back in before nightfall? And I took this picture and I got it printed and I took it to the, the home where she was staying. And I thought she might like it framed in her, her 
the room and she said, no, I want to open the door. I want people to know who I am. They can see the pictures of me skiing and kayaking and walking and everything when I'm younger, but they think I'm old now and they don't think I'm that person. So she had it on her And I went back about two or three years later. And by that time she'd forgotten niece, Jane, all of that. She just came up, pointed at me and she said, you took my favorite picture of me. And she took me to the door and showed me. And that was so proud. And she still connected with that because this is, this is how she wanted people to see her. But she was someone who could still do things. And she was someone that still loved to be outside. All of our trips, when we went out, I used to, I always had a hard car and we used to go off into the mountains. And we'd walk a little bit when she could. And when she couldn't, we'd just sit and wait for wildlife to come, hopefully, and see us. And um, it was really important to her that that was her facet of life and that people remembered who she was. And I think we've got to think about people. So, you know, what were their dreams? What were their aspirations? And what can we still do? So thank you.